I think if the economy is going to do anything and the margin is going to weaken, not get stronger, but um, you know, and you can see that some businesses are starting to struggle now, even though the stock prices don't go down because we have this ridiculous game of beat the number that Wall Street plays. Even sometimes when the stock prices don't decline in the wake of of a poor quarter, it doesn't mean it wasn't a poor quarter and there aren't inferences to be drawn. So I think we've been in a stagflationary period and I think we're going to continue to be that way at the, at the margin. I think, the, like I said, the economy will weaken, not strengthen. On this episode of the What the Finance podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on Bill Fleckenstein. Uh, so Bill is a professional money manager with over 30 years of experience. He writes a daily column and is the author of Greenspan's Bubbles, uh, The Age of Ignorance at the Federal Reserve. So Bill, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. No problem. Looking forward to speaking. Uh, and, and, you know, I've really appreciate your opinions. Uh, you've done quite a few of these interviews, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I guess from your perspective at the moment, what is the... What are you currently seeing in the uh, economy and, and markets? Well, I don't think I have any special insight uh, about, you know, where we are at the moment. Um, it's pretty clear the economy has slowed down and, uh, you know, over the course of the last year. Um, and I think that we've had more of a stagflationary environment than, than certainly the Fed wants to admit. I, I think we're going to continue to slow down. Um, one of the things that's confused many people, uh, myself included, along the way has been the enormous benefit that the large deficit has had in terms of keeping the economy sort of propped up. So we have an economy that's not great, but you know, okay in, in some sectors and weak in some, stronger in others. Um, and uh, I think the underlying inflation problem is going to continue to be with us, so it will ebb and flow as it had in the past. I think the right template for people to think about it is is a variation of the going from the late '60s to the '70s. I think we're in that we're in a similar period in terms of that dynamic. As far as the stock market goes, the stock the stock market has been. Uh, has been it's become structured quite differently over the last 15 years i don't know how much you are you or your uh, listeners are familiar with what is has become um a, the massive passive bid and by that i mean retirement money that flows largely to vanguard and blackrock where they just buy where, where they just have created a massive market index and that passive bid um, um has dramatically distorted the behavior of the stock market. Um, um, and it, it, it is likely to exert undue influence prospectively <clears throat> in both directions. Thus far, for the last 15 or 20 years, all there has been has, has been a, a positive um, contribution to market action um, um, because of the way that um, the, the money gets allocated. Um, uh, people have seen the upside of it. They have not seen the downside of it yet. The downside when it happens will be rather uh, brutal and unpleasant because you're going to re reverse the mindless buying on the upside with mindless selling on the downside. And that, that, that's going to be a big problem, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm just bringing it up in case anyone who is, Part of your, you know, uh, listener base um, is doesn't know that because you need you need to understand it. Um, so that and that's why we have these ridiculously valued large caps caps tech stocks where the fundamentals are nothing great. Like in particular, Apple is a great example. They haven't been able to grow earnings for you know going on two years now. It sports a PE north of thirty, um, and um, that's just one example. So anyway, I think that the market that, that we're in, there's a possibility that the, uh, the rally will continue, uh, particularly if the Fed decides to cut rates here in, in July and in September or just in September, or there continues to be the hope that that'll be the case. That could 
precipitate a continuation of the rally. It's there's a possibility that we may see smaller caps outperform. Recently, we've seen the the Russell index do quite a bit better than the Nasdaq, and part of that has been the unwinding of, of people that of of of, of market participants, players, hedge fund operators. Um, who have been long the big tech stocks, the so-called AI theme, and um, um, short the Russell as a hedge. Now that isn't working. And so you've seen an unwinding of that. And whether that's actually the start of a new trend, where maybe smaller stocks do better, um, I can't say. It may just be noise, but there is that, that is going on. And, I, and, and so uh, we are entering what, what could be, you know, maybe uh, – um, uh, another leg up. And if that were to occur, I think it would only increase the risks of um, something pretty ugly on the downside uh, later on this year, early next year. But for that to start, most likely you'll need to see some sort of a diminution in the flow of uh, money into um, the, the, the passive uh, entities. So that's a long that's a long answer. It's just a place to start, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, a lot covered. Thank, thanks for uh, laying it out for us. But uh, if, if we maybe focus on the economy, so you mentioned that uh, you've seen stagflation. Is that sort of more the trajectory you, you see, or do you think maybe the past few quarters has sort of suggested that the economy is in stagflation? No, I thought stagflation was going to be a likely outcome for quite some time, and I think it is. I mean, <clears throat> you know, there's not a precise definition of stagflation to me the one that I learned in the 70s um, 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 was, although I wasn't in the business until 1980, um, was the rate of inflation was higher than the rate of real growth. And um, so, um, and, and that's kind of where we've been. Um, um, I think if the economy is gonna do anything and the margin is gonna weaken, not get stronger, but, um, you know, and you can see that some businesses are starting to struggle now, even though the stock prices don't go down because we have this ridiculous game of beat the number that Wall Street plays, even sometimes when the stock prices don't decline in the wake of, of a poor quarter, it doesn't mean it wasn't a poor quarter and there aren't inferences to be drawn. So I think we've been in a stagflationary period and I think we're going to continue to be that way. At the, at the margin, I think, the, like I said, the economy will weaken, not strengthen. Okay, so despite, you know, uh, we were seeing quite strong uh, GDP growth numbers last year, but the fact that they were sort of lower than I inflation. Well, yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, but so the, the nominal GDP was strong. So, for instance, if, if, if you have a GDP growth of seven, just to pick a number, but inflation was four, then real growth was three and inflation was four. Uh, that's a little bit stagflationary to me. It, it's been, the numbers have been different than that, but that, that, that's what I'm saying. So you can't just look at the nominal number. You have to look at the real number because obviously if inflation was seven and, and nominal GDP growth was seven, I mean, you didn't grow at all. Just prices went up. Yeah, good point. I think we've seen that in a few of these companies where their, uh, you know, revenue keeps going up, but the units sold actually is in often cases, decreasing yeah. in some cases that's true so the the, the distinction between nominal and, and real hasn't been anything that's been uh a variable that anyone's that people have had to really pay attention to say from pick a number you know 2000 ish to um until say 2020 21 but it, it used to be that you needed to you know, back in the 80s and, and 90s, 70s. Um, and now I think you have to pay some attention to that. So so I think it's a distinction worth noting. Okay. And would you link debt into it? Because I think you were saying there that, you know, if we look at the growth, a lot of it has been boosted by this fiscal deficit. Sure. Uh, I mean, if you if you have a deficit that's, say, 6 or 7% of GDP, that's a big number. And if the money, if the money went, I'll make a, a ridiculous example. If for some reason all seven percent of that GDP went to rich people, it might not, not have much impact on the economy because they might save it, you know, or they might might spend it on a trip to Europe or something. However, if it went to people that don't have much money, they'd be likely to spend it. So if it went to the lowest seven percent of wage earners in this country or people without wages, 
that would flow right through to GDP. It might just be the Walmarts of the world that would see the benefit. But you, so just knowing that number doesn't necessarily tell you what it means. Yeah, it's a good point. And then I guess what, what impact has the Fed had on, do, do you think they've sort of kept rates too high? Do you think they've probably kept them too low? What, what are your thoughts on, on sort of their actions? Well, <laughs> the Fed is an agent of irresponsibility. That's the thing that they've been the best at uh, since Greenspan's early tenure. Uh, um, um, always uh, uh, creating too much liquidity, holding rates too low, being all, then ultimately, let's let's just do a quick recap. By holding rates too low and um, uh, the Y2K injection in December 99, Greenspan helped blow the top off the equity market. <clears throat> Then when that collapse happened, they started easing again, creating rates too low. And we started to have a real estate bubble, which they championed. <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, meanwhile, they weren't doing their job monitoring the balance sheets of the of the large banks that it was that had uh, required, required brokerage firms. And so we had the o, the 08 when the 08 bubble burst it nearly vaporized the financial system. <clears throat> In the wake of that, they started QE, which Ben Bernanke said was only going to be temporary. Um, Bernanke, who was also in, in the, a year before, sorry, several months before the subprime crisis metastasized, he said subprime was contained. I'm <clears throat> just giving you a flavor for the incompetence level of the head of the Federal Reserve at that, you know, at that time. Um, then they continued QE um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they did some QT eventually. And then the, the COVID disaster happened. It's a disaster from a policy standpoint, not that COVID itself was as bad as everyone said. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they started up QE again. And, you know, now we've got an $8 trillion balance sheet um, and their Fed is just dying to ease again. So I don't think their raising rates um, was a problem. I think they waited too long to do it. It was already obvious as a problem. They way overdid QE. They stayed with it way too long. But that has been the pattern from Greenspan to Bernanke to Yellen to Powell, each iteration has been more and more irresponsible. And now there, I don't think there's any possible chance they can ever reduce the balance sheet, um, um, you know, back to anything like where it was before, you know, it was 800 billion. Now it's I think around 7 trillion may, might be more. I haven't looked at it lately, but there's no chance they'll ever get it back to where it was. And in fact, if you had to, if you had to, if you asked me which way that which direction the next trillion was going to be, I would say up, because we'll have some problem and they'll they'll do it again. Yes, yeah, so you're not buying into the uh, power of rhetoric that uh, you know they're responsible. They're going to keep reducing the balance sheet. They're going to keep tight. They're going to yeah, <laughs> talk cheap. Should. I talk cheap. I mean, uh, our current president, uh, you know, two weeks ago said he was staying in the race, and Sunday he was gone. So. The word, I mean, the Federal Reserve is one step away from politicians in terms of what they say and then what they do. I mean, you can't you can't believe anything they say. Yeah, I guess we see during COVID when if things are falling apart, they'll come in and add a few extra trillion onto the. Yes, yeah, because and... because the 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 easing, you know, the the the, 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 the you know. The giving everybody drinks to the party, that's that's the easy part. Everyone loves you when you do that. It's when you take the punch bowl away or you tell them that, nah, folks, it's time to sober up. People don't like that. And uh, I'm making a, a bit of a joke out of it. But um, and 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 remember, the, the, the things that the Fed does, the problems that it creates sometimes don't show up for quite some time. Inflation lags the, the, the Fed has enabled because of their policies massive can kicking on the part of the federal government. You think that the, the deficit could have gotten to the size uh, that it is today, um, north of $30 trillion, if the Fed hadn't enabled all the money printing it put $8 trillion on its own balance sheet? No chance. We would have had to deal with some of the, some of the off balance sheet liabilities and fiscal problems that we have um, by now. Both Bush and Obama wasted the financial crisis that occurred not necessarily because of their policies, because when they came in, but they didn't do anything to improve the situation and nor did anyone else in Congress either. I mean, so 
the, the, the government is only going to do what would be considered the right thing from a long-term economic standpoint when there's a crisis. And we're 0 for 2 on doing something constructive out of the last two crises. In fact, the biggest thing that came out of the, um, the bust of the stock bubble in 2000 was Sarbanes-Oxley, which meant that, you know, if you were an exec, if you were an executive and signed financial statement, you were going to be personally liable uh, if those turn out to be not true. And then they never enforced them, as you can see when the 08 crisis hit. And then they almost nobody from the investment banks, brokerage firms and the people that lied up with their, on their balance sheets went to jail. So we didn't get anything constructive out of the out of the financial crisis. So you're going to have to ask yourself, how big is the one going to need to be to get us to start to address these problems? I don't know, but that's a that's not a problem for tomorrow, but it's a problem for sometime in the next few years, I would guess. What, what, what do you think they'd have to do to resolve the problems without a, maybe without a financial crisis? Is that possible? Oh, no. Without a financial crisis, chance is zero. I mean, look, in 08, we nearly vaporized the financial system and it happened on Bush's watch. So when Obama and the administration came in, they could have done pretty much whatever they wanted. And they, you know, they had the control of the house and the senate so they could have done whatever they wanted they could have done a lot of things they could have said you know what this isn't a problem for today but it's next decade we're going to deal with social security they could have said we need to means test it um we're going to create special savings accounts for certain things you could have given incentives for that they could have they could have done something intelligent from an energy standpoint they could have they could have incentivized natural gas exploration natural gas is a hydrocarbon is super cheap and it's uh, and it's relatively in clean burning, you know, and uh, so th they could have done a, a myriad of things, none of which they did. All we got was Obamacare. And despite the fact that it may have helped some people get access to health care, everyone's insurance rates have exploded in the wake of that. So my, my only point is I'm not picking on it because it's easy to pick on politicians because mostly all they do is grift. Um, but the, the the point being, we got nothing out of those. So, you know, now we have less runway because the budget deficit is so big and we keep expanding these social programs because we're putting new entrants in um, that there's going to be more pressure. But I don't know how big the crisis is going to have to be to cause the politicians to actually do something productive. Hey everyone, sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to extend a massive thank you uh, to you for, for listening and tuning in and, and for your support over these three years. So we've had, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, guests that we've welcomed on the podcast. We've uh, had millions of views with uh, hundreds of thousands of different people listening in. So uh, I just wanted to thank you. You know, I started this as a student uh, and now currently working uh, and I've always done this on the side just because I have a passion for it and I've enjoyed it and probably similar to yourself, you listen to all these, uh, you know, different YouTube channels and podcasts with people uh, listening to different guests. That, that's how I started and I uh, just wanted to sort of take the plunge and be able to have the opportunity to speak to these people and, and you've made that happen. So th thank you very much. Uh, just myself, don't make any money from this and it's really a passion project. So thanks for uh, supporting that, that passion of mine. Uh, if you wanted to support the channel, uh, all I ask is if you could like, subscribe, or even comment, you know, positive or negative feedback. I, I, I'm always <laughs> willing to take constructive criticism. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. Um, but otherwise, thanks so much. If you can believe it, only 14% of uh, our, our, our listeners actually subscribe to the podcast. So uh, yeah, if you can, great. If not, no problem at all. Uh, thanks for listening. And yep, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot to ask of them to do something like that. But uh, if we look at, you know, we've mentioned stagflation before, you think that's, you know, the way it's going. And as you're saying, it might not be that inflation goes high. It's just that it's, it's higher than the uh, sort of re real GDP growth. Is that what you're expecting? Or do you think inflation could sort of increase back to levels that we've seen in the well, past few years? We, 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 we have to be clear on one thing. There's the overall price level. And then, then there's the rate at which it increases or decreases. So you know, the prices of a lot of goods and services are up, you know, let's just, let's pick a round number. If, if the price is up a hundred percent, went from one to $2, but then it backs off to one ninety five. If it's something you need on a regular basis, it's still way up, even if it isn't increasing rapidly. And then if it goes down to one ninety five and bounces between one ninety nine and one ninety three and then two Oh two, you're, you're, you're going to get 
bounces around in the rate of inflation, but the underlying increase in the price level hasn't gone away and people, people are still behind from that standpoint. So when you discuss inflation, it's a tricky topic because there's the absolute price level and there's the rate of change of that price. And then there's the rate of change of the rate of change. And we can, you know, we can get down to a lot of little details there, but um, the, 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 the pressure precipitated by higher prices is going to be with us for a long time. And it, at the margin, the pressures are going to be on the upside for a lot of things. Yeah, good point. We often look at the 12 months trailing, but if you look at the last four years. Yeah, and you kind of have to because the rate of changes was so huge. And now, you know, they're talking about 2.3 or 3% inflation, whatever. And like they're all talking. But yeah, but it's on top of a massive increase. It's not going away. So, um, I mean, some, some, some prices, the prices of some things may see uh, some relief and others may not. So certainly hasn't seen any price if you're paying for auto insurance or various kinds of insurance or you know, housing may start to have some pressure on the downside in certain areas, others not. Um, you know, and healthcare has been, is going to remain expensive. So again, uh, I think we're going to be stuck, this for, stuck with this underlying problem for quite some time. Yep, good point. So you, you mentioned that you think, you know, markets could potentially can, continue to go up to the end of this year, start of next year, um, influenced by, you know, passive, I guess that's sort of reducing the amount of shares for sale, which, you know, reduce the amount of money needed to actually in increase the, the value and decrease the value of, of these uh, assets. Um, are there any other, I guess, influences you think are sort of encouraging this or that, is that the main... Well, I mean, it, it, through the back door, it, it reduces the number of shares for sale. I mean, remember what happens is Vanguard gets the money. The money comes in mindlessly from corporate America because it's part of your compensation and it goes to Vanguard and they just buy their, their weightings in the index. So it's it's the force of the buying. Now, they do re also reduce the shares because they're not for sales. So that reduces the float to some degree. So both of those factors are at work, but it's and it's, their, it's the buying that, that puts it up and it's the lack of selling that helps keep it up. Um, and that's going to be, and, and that is a very important factor. Um, um, also is, as is, you know, what the Fed, what the Fed does and the, the, the federal, if the Fed, if the Fed cuts rates in July, which I don't think that they will, but I don't know, um, it would probably precipitate you know, more, uh, you know, more upside. And if, if it's speculative enough, it could, it, it could, it, it could put more speculation on top of years and years of speculation and a, and a, and a, and a, and a misallocated capital structure that could, would make the downside that much, that, that much uglier and make it that much easier to trip the market over as some event. If we got to the point where, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, we were starting to see serious layoffs and there wasn't enough money coming in to the passive uh, uh, spectrum, then you could set the stage for the natural ebbs and flows that occur in markets, creating some real pressure to the downside, which would be uh, uh, disproportionate to whatever news event triggered it. In other words, the stock market has been an accident waiting, waiting to happen for a decade and a half. You know, as this passive layer has built up, built up, built up, but that hasn't mattered. And maybe it won't matter for another year. I don't, it's not possible to know when you just can't be in the, involved in the market and not know what that has done and the risk that it entails um, prospectively if anything were to go uh, wrong for real. So there's no yeah. predictive there's no predictive element to it. It's just a danger that you have to be aware of and you have to take it into how you think about things. Yeah. And I think, you know, I heard something today that, you know, ExxonMobil, one of the largest energy, you know, excluding Saudi Aramco, it's the largest energy company in the world. I think 50% of their shares outstanding are uh, you know, owned by pension funds and uh and sort of retail investors, which is which is amazing. For, you know, that's hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's, it's an absolutely amazing fact. Um, which is very unique to the U.S. compared to sort of every other global um, market. But uh, yeah, so if we, you know, you said it's that could be an influence or could make things worse. What are you really going to watch to see 
when this uh, sort of, you know, if it goes up, goes down, what do you watch? Well, the, the, there's no, the, 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 the passive variable, just to pick a name for it, is a huge component. Um, but n I've known that now for years. It hasn't mattered. Okay. But I think we could be coming up to a period where it, where it may it, where it may actually matter. We could get some real disruption around the election. We could have a event we couldn't foresee. I mean, I don't really I didn't expect a week ago Saturday that you know uh, they were going to try to assassinate Trump. I mean, what would have occurred had they been successful? Um, you know, um, uh, or, 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 or you could pick a group of other events. So it's, 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 it's when the event occurs that precipitates selling and the underlying bid of the pass passive isn't big enough to help uh, swamp that. <clears throat> and if, and if the passive side was in a <clears throat> selling mode because you, you know uh, employment had drifted lower, you could have a big accident. You know you could have a crash in the market. Now, I'm not saying it <clears throat> will happen. I'm just saying it's 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 a bigger possibility than people think, and not tomorrow, but in the you know next couple of years. Um, and so you just have to be aware of that, and then you have to look to events. So you have to monitor. Um, employment, not just from a, what economic standpoint, but what it also might mean for, for that. There's a fellow named Mike Green. I don't know if you've interviewed him or you know him or your readers do. He's the one that brought some this to my attention. I mean, I, think I found it out because of him about four years ago. And, and, and <clears throat> it's made a huge difference in my, in, in my ability to figure out how to manage my risk or how much I can take and how, when I should be careful. It, ha it hasn't led to any <clears throat> large scale risk reduction yet, but but it's something you have to be aware of. I mean, it's a big deal. Okay. And, and what else are you watching? You, you know, you mentioned the economic data. You know, is there anything else that you're that you're watching as well uh, to sort of help with your, your risk management or just your positioning in general? No, I mean, you have to take everything into consideration, of course. Um, but, and, uh, and obviously the outcome of the election will have some <clears throat> some serious consequences, you know, maybe just for certain industries. It depends on who wins, you know, how the ticket goes, you know, how it goes down ticket, you know, the ramification of the election will matter. It may matter leading up to it, may matter after, I, I can't say. Um, so that the economy, you know, employment, you know, the, 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 those, those are the key, key cri only critical things you can monitor. And then what the companies themselves tell you on their earnings calls. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Good point. So, um, if we look at you know you mentioned quite an interesting strategy that you said people were using, which was um was a long sort of AI and then short uh, Russell two thousand, which has worked mm -hmm. quite well at least up until recently when the Russell uh, had a bit of a surge. Um, so I guess what do you what, what do you think the thinking behind that was, and do you see a, the potential for maybe a broadening out of the market, or is it sort of uncertain at the moment? Um, the rationale was. People want not much was going up well regularly. And, and you got this basket of the big cap tech stocks, the so-called Magnificent Seven, which is one of the dumbest names ever. Um, and then you had all the AI wannabes and anything that could claim to be related to that concept. Those stock prices of those companies did phenomenally well. And they were jumping, you know, in huge gulps, you know, billions and billions of dollars with a market cap added willy nilly. Um, and um, so if you owned a lot of that stuff, but you felt like, well, gosh, you know, what if something goes wrong? I need to be hedged somehow. And, you know, a lot of what, what, what became a popular trade was to hedge it with uh, the Russell. Uh, and uh, th those stocks, that index really wasn't, wasn't doing anything. And now what's happened is, and that's flipped in the last couple of weeks. Now, the question is, has that flipped simply because the some of the AI, AI wannabes have been hit hard or hit hit to some degree? And 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 so guys are uh, are taking down that exposure and that means they have to take off some of the hedge. So we're seeing selling in the stuff that was working and buying a uh, short covering in the, in the stuff that wasn't working. Um, uh, 
And, and now what's happened is it's flipped. So the IWM or the Russell is doing well and the NASDAQ names are not. Now, is this simply just a large amount of that trade unwinding? Or is there an actual rotation where people are saying, hmm, I still want to be in the market because I think the market's going up for whatever reason. But I think these big cap tech stocks have had too big of a run. And I think some of the smaller companies might do better. That would be a rotation. And that could be occurring. Or it could be just a knee-jerk reaction of taking off these trades, unwinding the ones that had previously worked. I don't know the answer to that question. It's too new. Um, you could make an argument that there's going to be some rotation. Uh, it's not necessarily because all the small caps are cheap because they're not. They're just not as expensive as the other stuff. So I don't know exact. I don't know how this is going to play out. Um, uh, I, I have a suspicion that they might try to take some of these smaller companies up as they sell the bigger expensive ones. But I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. And, and the you know, it's it's kind of too early to tell. I think. Is there any trend or any anything that you're watching which has uh, surprised you or which has caught your eye or which is sort of uh, you know that you're carefully watching to? I think a new development may be the dollar may be in the process of rolling over. And if that's the case, uh, that would have some ramifications for fixed income and which equities might do better and which might do worse. Um, I happen to think maybe the yen is going to have a, a run to the upside, but I, I don't, I don't know that that's going to make much difference to the, you know, the, the, the average, average investor out there. Um, I mean, I think that's the only new thing that's changed. I mean, the, the switch between the massive tech stocks working and the small and the small cops working is a big deal. And it just started, like I said, whether it's noise or reality, I don't know yet. And it looks like the dollar may be in the process of rolling over, particularly against the yen. But again, that's kind of early days too. So, um, I mean, you know, the, the, those are the two most uh, worthwhile shifts that have occurred recently, I think. Okay, and if we look at the dollar, is that just because uh, you know there's expectations of uh, sort of rate cuts in the near term, um, or, or do you think there's something else driving that? Yeah, it, it, it you know all of these major currencies are really flawed because all the governments are doing the same things, the central banks are all doing the same things. In the case of Japan, uh, if you looked at it from a purchasing power parity basis, the yen is really very cheap, and the Japanese are it looks like they're in the process of having to hike rates i think they will begin a rate hiking cycle now whether it's soon or farther down the road i don't know they've been really slow to do that but they with the weak currency and importing so many things you know they've got some domestic inflation so they can certainly afford to raise rates so at the margin they might be raising rates we might be cutting rates um and so therefore the dollar may be a little less attractive from a, from but, but you know from a geopolitical I'm sorry from a um, macro standpoint they all are flawed for pretty much the same reasons so it's not like there's any standout currency one can own anymore if you want to express um, an opinion that is negative on currencies in general your only real solution is to own gold or silver uh, I'm 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 not in the Bitcoin camp so I can't add that asset I know that'll make a lot of people unhappy but um, it's just not something that I feel confident in. Do you think an economy like Japan can increase interest rates with such a high level of debt? Well, remember, the central bank owns half of it already. So half of it, for all intents and purposes, half of it doesn't exist because they're just going to repay, repatriate the money that they get from the coupons from the government right back to the Ministry of Finance. So, yes, they have a lot of debt, but they 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 bought back half of their debt with money they printed, you know, so they're farther ahead in the game, you know, the game of irresponsibility and the outcomes that you get with that than, than anyone else. Um, I mean, for the longest time, I, that was one of my big curiosities was how was the, how was the move from zero interest rates and negative interest rates going to end? And we're in the process of seeing that, but um, Japan does have, uh, a high level of debt relative to GDP, but you got to cut that number in half. When you do, it's not so bad relative to everyone else. And how long do you think that lasts? Or do you think it would just be sort of what we're seeing, you know, asset appreciation, appreciation against how, how, how these long, gold and silver? How long does what last? I'm sorry. 
Well, I guess the um, monetization of, of sort of their debt because uh, it's going to last yeah. until the central banks can't get away with it. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Let's say um, that the economic data gets a little worse. And let's just say the Fed cuts in July and bonds rally, all whole curve, you know, interest rates come down across the curve and we get to September and they do it again. And then the bond market rallies for a while and then starts to decline for, for seriously. If you get into a period where the central bank cuts rates and the curve from say seven to 30 starts to see rates rise after they've cut and this yield curve then steepens because long end interest rates rise and bond prices go down then that would be the bond market saying, we don't trust you. We think the policies you're pursuing are going to be bad for any, for anyone to hold, hold long-term uh, uh, paper. Uh, and that's my shorthand version of describing that process is this, the, 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 the bond market is taking away the printing press from the central banks. If we start to see that, that will be the start of real trouble. Oh, we will see it someday. I mean, because... They're all, they only have one policy, really, these central bankers. This has gone on so long. They only have the policy of printing more. They can try to hike. They only get so far before they try to hike, and then they got to go the other way. Um, and um, that's the, that's that will be the start of, of, of real trouble when when they try to print their way out of the next problem, and 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 it, and it starts to backfire from a, from a bond market perspective. Okay, yeah, Max, that makes sense. Um, so, Bill, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? Uh, the message is, is you have to make sure that the game you're playing is the game you think you're playing. I stole that quote more or less from Mike Green, the fellow I just mentioned to you, uh, who first made me aware of what was going on from a passive investment standpoint. And the reason I say that is because you can't look at the stock market as a free market that adjudicates prices by the, by the action of, of all the market participants. Half the market is this mindless, passive robot that just buys stocks. So you have to understand what that means and the consequences. Then you have to understand the, the flows that, are, that come in from the option market and what that means and all the other variables. But you have to make sure that, that you know w what the game is that you're actually playing. And you don't want to be playing by rules that you think exist that don't. Yeah, that's a great message. So thanks again. If anyone wanted to find out more about your work and what you do, where would the best places for that be? Well, if you, for some reason, wanted to see my Twitter feed, it's at FleckCap. Um, I write a daily column that I've been writing since 1996. Um, where I talk about what interests me, a little about the action of the market. And I also answer questions. Um, my website is fleckensteincapital.com. It's a pay site. It costs $130 a year. I made the price so cheap that anyone could afford it, but I didn't want to give it away for free because when you give stuff away for free, that's what it's worth. Um, anyway, that's how you can find me. Perfect. I'll put that in the description below, but thanks again for your time. Okay, take it easy. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate the support. Uh, if you have got value out of this, I'd, I'd really uh, appreciate it if you could like, subscribe, or, or comment, you know, good or bad <laughs> feedback. I'm always open to that. But it really helps with the channel. Uh, as I said before, only about 14% of people actually subscribe to this channel. So if you were to that, it would really help. It could mean we could continue to grow. Um, if not, thanks for watching and see you on the next show. And you also might like uh, this video right here. All right, thanks again.